This month on Central Christian Church Crucial Conversations, we are talking about economic justice. Join us on Thursdays as we talk with guests who are engaged in the struggle for economic justice and listen to learn more about how you can get engaged. Hi, and welcome back to Central Christian Church Crucial Conversations. We are coming to you from Indianapolis, uh, Indiana at Central Christian Church. My name is Grace, and this is Pastor Luis and Pastor Linda. And we are wrapping up a series of conversations on economic justice. If you've been tuning in, you know that we have talked to some central, uh, not central, Christian Theological Seminary students um, who were in a Prophets and Poverty class with me. And we also talked to some folks from Results, an organization working to build the political will to end poverty. So we've had lots of really interesting conversations about these issues from multiple different angles. And um, so today at this episode, we're going to just be wrapping things up and talking about some standout moments from previous episodes. So um, Linda, Luis, what stood out for you um, as you were watching uh, the previous episodes? Well, for me, um, I think what I appreciated about uh, both sets of conversations um, focus on on. Um, issues of economic justice and poverty. Uh, when you talk to Maxine and Lisa, I believe, uh, how do you address it um, in the larger scale as far as uh, through legislation, through grassroots connections? And then with um, your classmates, it was in the sense of their church and their community in which they are a part of here in Indianapolis. Uh, so for me, um, listening to those different perspectives of how we can address economic justice systemically and then also locally. Um, I appreciate the conversations around those, those two areas. Yeah. The, uh, there were a lot of things that I really appreciated. <clears throat> I guess um, the sort of one thing that stood out is the clarity about like, we are not where we need to be. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not a news flash. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody, I don't think anybody can really seriously defend, you know, a system with, you know, billionaires while children are hungry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so putting that into, you know, con stark contrast. So I just remember Michael's line that I so appreciated about um, the normal being what we've come to expect accept, accept. We've come to accept the normal and to um, shift from accepting the normal to expecting what God expects. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that made me think about what, uh, just, you know, just how we make that shift. And it, it made me wonder, you know, it, we, we talk a lot about sort of the the consequences of an unjust economic system, but we don't talk too much about the system itself. Mm -hmm. Like the, the system that we have in the United States and in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think partly, there, there's, I think there's different reasons. Partly economics is kind of intimidating. Right. You know, it's big and it's big numbers and it's complicated. And you know, who are we to think that we should be able to you know, have some opinions in this because we don't know enough. Right. Um, but, and then I think also we, we're at this point where it's um, you know, certain economic systems that we have knee-jerk reactions to them. Mm -hmm. So to use the word socialism mm -hmm. in the United States you know, brings up you know, strong reactions right because it's become this sort of boogeyman. Mm -hmm. So I just, as I was thinking about this, uh, my father came to mind quite a bit because um, he worked a, a lot of his, he worked for the church um, on economic justice issues as well as race. And I just remember him saying like, it's not that there's no Christian system. What we have to do is bring our Christian ethic to the systems and you know 
arguing between capitalism and socialism, there are also no pure systems. It's always a mixture. You know, we have a socialist system in our, you know, police department and fire department. We pay taxes so that schools can operate, you know. And so it, it's always about the mix. And I just, um, I, so I just wonder sort of, you know, we're talking a lot about the church and how the church can, can have an impact if one of the ways is really to like educate ourselves, right. um, to really go and look at, at economics and at systems um, and, and realize that they're not inevitable. It doesn't have to be this way. It, there, were, there have been intentional choices made all along the way that have created the system that we're a part of and that we have power, therefore, to make different choices right. and, and come up with a system that works better for more people, which I think is where our you know, faith perspective would have us go. Yeah. yeah, one thing I appreciate you bringing up is this idea of education, especially on economic systems. Um, I was talking to a friend recently about all these issues and she was saying that her mentor suggested to her that she should take some sort of economics course. So she's like, it's not very like, and for both of us, we were like, really, do we like have to? Because is it not enough to just be like, this is just bad. We can just do something else, right? Um, it's sort of like if you ask, uh, please, no one ask me any questions about like how stocks work or, you know, cause I'm like, I don't know. I just think it's some sort of racket. So, um, so but that education piece, I do think, on how we got here um, is really important. And then I also appreciated um, from Michael and Janae's conversation seeing um, different ways that their churches have sort of been engaged in this. Um, I, I had heard some about um, you know, what Janae's church, Eastern Star, has done with like their um, affordable housing and grocery um, uh, in that neighborhood, but sort of the way that they have taken an intentional approach to um, this, their surrounding area, um, I found to be very, um, very exciting. Yeah. So it's, it, so for me, it goes to the question of, you know, then who's responsible for this change, right? Because in each in each way, you know, when you look at the examples of um, Eastern Star and, and Michael, when he brought it up about you know how much money churches have and what they use that money for, right? Instead of building it for edifices that are 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 so large, what are you doing with the other portions of those things? Um, I, I think that's where I'm most challenged, right? I'm most challenged because do we we have a system that we want our local government, our state government, our federal government to intercede on our behalf mm -hmm. in these areas that seem overwhelmingly difficult to address ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it seems more plausible for churches and local, um, you know, not-for-profits or anything to address these issues and actually get at making some results. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we still have these systems right. that perpetuate over and over again, you know, um, uh, poverty or economic injustice. Um, my son recently graduated from high school last year and one of his arguments as a high school student was, why do I have to learn algebra, mm -hmm. right? Or any kind of school math, why can't you teach me how to manage money mm -hmm. or help me understand business mm -hmm. and stocks and stuff like that? Right, meaning he, as a 18 year old, 19 year old, he's saying, this is how our, our economy works. Why are, you, why are you not teaching me the practical thing that helps me in my everyday life? Not to say that algebra doesn't. And for all of our teachers and mathematicians, that's not what I'm saying. For him, he's just looking at the practical. Right. I know this is going to work. Right. It's going to help me. I deal with it every day. How do I then learn about that? to make sure that I don't fall into some of those particular pitfalls. Um, and I, so that is one of the, the, the challenges um, in, in that is, you know, how do we educate? Right. So is it our, like, 
I, I think about our church, right? Our church is a little bit more affluent. So do we need economic classes to help people with their, you know, with their savings and their checkings and how to manage their money? Do we need, or is that something we can provide to the community we serve, right? But then you ask the question is, you know, how, what does that look like for an affluent church to be telling, you know, people in lower incomes how to manage their money, right? right? So you have the different dynamics in those, uh, in those situations, but right. I think education is really important. Yeah. Yeah, I think, so like, but then again, there's this tension of like, how, how much can you educate yourself out of a bad system? Like how, how can I tell someone, you know, here's how you manage your money. And also like you, you never had enough to begin with. <laughs> like, um, and so like that sort of, um, major systemic inequality. Um, and I think also uh, to your point about us being a more affluent church, like, I don't know if we, any of us would be like part of the 1%, but we are part of a comfortable, like a very comfortable for the most part. There, there is like economic diversity within our church, mm -hmm. certainly, yes, yes. but um, for a, a large percentage of us, there is this level of like, well, we recognize the system is bad, but also the system has worked like decently. <laughs> for us um, in terms of like the, you know, like home ownership, not being hungry, um, adequate schooling, you know, like all these things. Saving that, for retirement. Saving for retirement, yeah. So like all of these different things. Um, I think, so that for me is a, is a big struggle. So on the one hand, I, you know, we have Lisa and Maxine taking on these really big systems um, and then hearing about how like churches can orient themselves. But what about, I think one thing I'm wondering about is what about all of us just sort of benignly comfortable people um, who can be sort of like um, passively going along in the system because it works um, until for some people it doesn't with, you know, financial crashes, like the housing bubbles, again, like reasons why I should be taking an economics class so I can say more about that than that. Um, but yeah, so like what, a, so what's the message, um, other than like you, you can get involved in advocacy, like people do have power to do that kind of thing. But in terms of our personal edu education about personal finances, um, is there, um, you, you know, we, we have lots of examples of like Jesus in the gospels, giving people very practical advice on how to, <laughs> how, what they should be doing, um, with their comfort. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, so, uh, a while back, uh, I was a part of a program called Flourish and Flourish helped, uh, pastors, um, and be educated about their finances, how to plan for their future, their retirement, medical costs, all this. And one of the most interesting things that I learned uh, within the first few years there is how we perceive economics and money and all that is really connected to our how we grew up, right? So we started looking at, you know, uh, how our parents manage money or uh, how much, you know, money you had or did not have. So if you're talking about how we perceive, right? You're talking about how individuals who come from uh, a better situation, how they and their children are gonna react in certain economic situations. Meaning, I spend money in this particular way because that's how I saw my parents. I don't worry about these things because I didn't see those. I started looking at myself and I started reading all my anxieties around money were based on whatever situation I can recall as a kid mm -hmm. where my parents were financially, right? Uh, so as an adult, when I'm in those situations, it triggers me to feel in those particular ways. So uh, a lot of it is how do we help people understand what are, you know, what are some of their own triggers, right, um, in, in, in the economics, and then helping that, them understand how that also connects to the people that we're working with and serving, right? It isn't just, you know, how do you budget and a livable wage, it's also how do you feel money works for you. Right. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, we, we I'm not sure that they talked about, but it mentions around is 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 the understanding of wealth. Mm -hmm. 
right? Um, and how they how we view wealth in our churches and in our homes. There's people who have a lot of money, but they're not necessarily emotionally wealthy. They're not spiritually wealthy. And so I think there is an overall balance uh, that I think we as the church and individuals can help address and work towards um, so we're not striving to attain uh, you know, material possessions uh, or you know, why is it in, at the start of a pandemic people are rushing to the store to grab all, all the paper towels or, and toilet paper and sanitizer. Right. Some is because the fear is going to run out. Others for the opportunity to what to sell them at a lot, a larger value, supply and demand. Right. Right. Those kind of things. That was in school. So, I mean, that was <laughs> that's <laughs> it. Stuck. The, the, it came up right now. It came up right now yeah. <laughs> so um, there is I, I, I hate to say that I don't I don't necessarily think these are overly complicated. Uh, I think it, it goes with our. our our human desire to want things and then to and then then to survive. How do you survive? I gather more things. I gather more possessions, which means I get to stay around a lot longer. So it's all human instinct in different ways, um, and greed is like that. It is I want more, um, which allows me to leverage other situations, right? Um, so the in betweeners have to figure out, and I'm talking for myself, right, as a um, a Latino male who is middle class and I don't worry about certain things that other Latinos worry about in my community. Uh, I, I, have, I have access, right? Um, as much as, as I think about it, that's, it is a privilege and it's also a, a challenge, right? So uh, what do I do? Um, I, 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 you, for me, it's, you know, a foot in both 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 places yeah. you know how do we yeah I, I i think that's a place the church can really provide um something really beneficial so i think the church can be a place that is both safe and challenging to people who are kind of in the middle i mean to many of us who are who have enough you know we're not worrying about putting food on the table and, um, but, you know, and, and some of us, you know, end up for a variety of reasons, whether it's work or inheritance, you know, with, with a pot of money, with some money that, that, that does make us, you know, sort of feel uncomfortable when you look around. At the same time, there's all these pressures of the world saying, you could run out, right. you might, you might not have that, so you need to, it's the responsible thing to do for yourself. It's the responsible thing for your children. And that is, that's not untrue, that that is true. And so I think, you know, part of what we do at this church, I think, you know, decently well, is we live in ambiguity. We live, um, you know, without the answers, without having all the answers. And so to recognize that these, you know, these are questions that are, they're constant, mm -hmm. right? I mean, every day right. we're making economic decisions, we're managing our money. And, um, and so any day we can decide in different ways mm -hmm. and, and we're probably not gonna come to a perfect place. Right. And we're gonna, there, so some level, you know, some, in some ways that discomfort is, is kind of a holy, holy space as well because it's because we're not you know relaxing into something that again doesn't work for a huge number of people in the world one thing that i'd yeah love to talk a little bit more about is this idea of um so one of the things that results um was talking about is this building political will to end poverty so this idea that um, you know, in a lot of like prosperity gospel situations, it's, it's this idea that like poverty is a choice of the individual results is saying results is the choice of a society. Um, and so, um, I think another area that I think could be helpful for the church to be working on is, 
uh, in that same vein of education, this idea that um, we, in the United States, the expectation is that you should strive for more, that there's virtue in being wealthy, that like you, um, that your wealth says something very positive about you. Um, And then on the flip side of that, to really look down on people who are living in poverty and viewing that as like a, um, some sort of moral failing on the part of the individual. And so I think the church can do a good job of educating people about um, how we should perceive others in Mm -hmm. relation to money. Um, Mm -hmm. Because... um, yeah, just this idea of um, there's nothing morally wrong with with people who are who are poor, and and this idea that we, for the people in the middle, we are economically much closer to being poor than we are to being like super wealthy. So this idea of like we should be striving after something where like in a capitalist system, there can't be more than like three one Jeff Bezos. Like, it doesn't work that way. Like, there, there's a top for the reason, and it's very few people. So, like, the, this idea of, like, really reorient, reorienting our attitudes toward, like, how we tie the amount of money you have and how good a person you are. Um, and that, I think, can be very difficult to unlearn. I remember um, when I first lived um, outside the, well, I guess, Almost the first time. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was in my 20s, I lived in Mexico. Um, it was kind of my first major experience in a, in a different culture and um, different, uh, mostly you know, people of a different economic class. And I remember being so struck by the fact that, that there was no sense of shame around poverty. Mm-hmm. People were poor. I mean, you know, just about everybody was poor. Mm-hmm. It, it really was so clear it was not a reflection of people's effort to, to, to make a living. And, um, and, and I mean, ever since then, I've just, you know, it's been stark contrast in the United States. And I, I'm sure that has changed somewhat as globalization has, um, you know, taken, taken hold over, you know, the decades. But, um, but, yeah, but yeah, I mean, here in the U.S., it is just, I mean, it's, it's, it is failure. It's seen as failure, um, and it's and that's just such a such a you know just such a trap mm-hmm. for people to be taught that if they're poor, it's it's their fault. Yeah, yeah I'm reminded about the conversations uh, from the podcast, and I think it was Michael and Janae's conversation. Uh, I think Michael kept saying, kept using the the verse in in Matthew that the poor will always be with you, right? And the, the, the challenge I have uh, in general with, with those statements and those reminders is, yes, the poor may be with us, but that is because of human behavior, right? And how we interact with others. When I think about the gospel, when I think about you know, how God interacted in the, in, in the Old Testament, there's always been provisions right, for those who don't have enough, right, whether it be, uh, you know, leaving, um, you know, uh, enough for the widows uh, to glean and and for the aliens who are coming to glean, meaning there's cycles of life, right, and sometimes you're in a good situation and other times you're in a bad situation, and so there is provisions that we as a society are meant to do what? In times where it's good, do what you can, prepare for those moments that are bad and help others, right? Um, when you, you think about the year of Jubilee, if you've accumulated too much debt because of your down cycle, be wiped away. Why? Because those things have generational ties to it, right? Which became indentured servitude, which then became slavery, which meant, you know, you have generations after generations that are affected. And so, I think the conversation about economics and uh, that is, is very nearsighted. It's, it's usually about the current situation that we're in and not necessarily generations ago, right? Like, right? Why is it important to help make sure you have no debt? Why is it important to make sure that um, 
you know, we kids have educations. Why? Because this is not about the current situation. It's about the generations that come. We know that if you, kids are not starting out in pre-K, how that can have a detrimental effect to them later on in other years. So we want to make sure things are in place, right? So it's the same thing with economics. If, if education has, if we don't start education at a certain age, then why wait until they're in high school to start talking about money? As a parent, that's challenging, right? right? Yeah, birthdays come along and your kids get money and they go from having no dollars to a hundred bucks or maybe 50 or 25 At times. I'm talking about inflation here, people. Um, it was $5 in my time. Um, but the reality is, the, what's the first thing kids want to do? Let's go to the store and buy something. And so as a parent, it's like, it's their, it's their money, right? And at the same time, you want to help them. Like, I remember that my parents going, hey, you put a little bit of money for yourself. You give some money to the church. My parents and my family always talked about giving offering. And they would use the word tithing. Make, and I'm like, yeah, but you guys got jobs. I don't always get money. So <laughs> I don't know about this, you know, 10% thing, right? So, but the reality is, is it is difficult, right? So we want our children to be happy. We, you know, we want them to have some type of independence. Right. Uh, but then they're kids. They see something, they want it, right? So how do we help them understand? And I think the, the last aspect is, like I'm thinking about how our culture has shifted over the generations. We went from being extremely agriculture to industrious, right? And in the agricultural life, the Garyan life, there's some sense of responsibility to what you have, right? And so if I'm doing this, and I know my neighbor's doing this, I had a good harvest and they don't got a good harvest. I'm like, here, we got to eat. Right. We've gotten away from that sense of neighborhood and that right. sense of connection that I know that I struggle. And if I have some, I want to help you. Right. right. And I know when you struggle, it's there. It's not, I'm doing this so we can, but it's the sense of, I care for others. And it really is a sense of attitude and how we perceive things that is, is really challenging. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I think what you said, like about the poor always being with us um, and that being something challenging to hear. I read um, a book called Missional Economics for a class a few semesters ago, and he was talking about a lot of what, the reason why the, it was written in that way is the poor will always be with you because we have these codes and people just weren't following them. <laughs> it's like, if, if, if you just did what I said, like then the poor maybe wouldn't be with you, but I know you, so the poor will always be with you. But then also, I think too, this idea of the more moving from agrarian to industrial, I think before, um, it might have been easier to see yourself in solidarity with people who are poor because again like filling in gaps if you had a bad harvest like someone else could fill in the gap and then you go on to fill the gap later um so th thinking of the poor will always be with you in a like much more solidarity aspect of like we are with each other rather than oh the poor will always be with you the people that you drive by that um, make you uncomfortable like they're just always going to be around and so do you really need to do anything about that. I think rethinking, really you know, how we're engaging in that. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a rabbit hole of things. <laughs> there are lots of ways to uh, go. Yes. I mean, yeah. Go. It's just there's listening to those conversations for me are it's hard and it's sad. Yeah. It's it's really sad to hear those realities that these things are still going on, right? Like maybe as a, a, a young man, I still feel like I'm a young man, but there's this, this, this sense of hope, right? That things can change. We get a glimpse of these things and then we revert back to our behaviors. And I'm talking about as a society as a whole, uh, not necessarily just personally, like we, we go through these particular cycles and maybe it's time for us to realize that, you know, we're putting a lot of 
uh, emotional and energy into the political capital of how these things can change. And maybe it's more important that we spend it on personal capital, like on people and communities. Um, because it only seems that when there's change in that level that the other powers go, wait a minute, you know, if, if we can do things that don't need those individuals, right. then why don't we do it? Mm -hmm. yeah. right. I mean, to me, that makes, right? right. That, and, and that's also as a, um, <laughs> just skip them. Okay, I'm not sure we can skip them all together, but you're saying to, like create communities of mutual support or create small systems that sort of fly under the radar of the big, bigger system. Do we need to have another podcast for this? No, 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 I, 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 I honestly think, and this is hard, right? We have, we have put so much trust into the systems that can change, right? That the reality is not that they cannot change, but they, they're only gonna change to their own benefit more than anything else. And it's not, it's not gonna be the benefit of the people. Right, so we talk about all the issues of economic justice that surround our city. When we start supporting organizations that are directly involved, that don't have political connections, I think that's where movement happens, creativity happens, and change can happen. Not to say that they aren't important, but when we place more value in the fact that they can do more, Right. That then goes to show where we have our value. Right. We're saying that because they have the power, we're going to value what they can do as opposed to individuals that we're actually trying to help out. Right. It's, it's the same. It's the same thing. So why not spend time supporting those who are uh, the communities that need it, need our energy and to say, I'm going to spend more time. And, and that's challenging because like I think about the results and what right. they do. But that's grassroots, right. right? That's grassroots, which is how do I get people in these areas to go and advocate here? Right. Um, and which is, I think, why people over time get disheartened with the, you know, the systems that we are trying to deal with. And when I talk about systems, I'm talking about our, our local politics. I'm talking about our state politics, I'm talking about our national politics, right. you know? Um, those are the things that I'm referring to. Um, not to say that they cannot, that they can't be helped, or they, they're not, but to rely solely upon them to make change right. um, isn't where the energy, in my opinion, should, should be. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think I hear what you're saying, that, you know, the, the the people who run the systems are not going to act in ways that um, contradict their self-interest. Correct. Everybody operates out of self-interest, whether it's there at the grassroots or, or at the very top. Um, so, yeah, for me the question is, like, how do we empower the people? How do we empower ourselves out of our own self-interest? Mm -hmm. Uh, and how do we empower the majority of people to, to work in their own self-interest? I mean, there's been, you know, really just such interesting dynamics um, around how pr uh, white middle class and lower, lower middle class and poor people often vote and act in contradiction to their own self-interest. They support policies that hurt them because of racism, basically, but but if we could, you know, I, I, so to me, that's where like that that's energizing to me is to think about how we can um, build power from from the grassroots um, up. You know, so this has been a really great conversation, and obviously <laughs> we've solved all the problems, um, but. One thing that I'm going to take away from this conversation is that um, as comp one of the things that gives 
me hope, I guess, is that as complicated as these issues can be, as intractable as they may seem, um, that means there are many, many entry points for taking action against them. And I think, and I think that also means that there is room for mutual aid and support if that is what energizes you. And there is room for like this, um, advocacy and like changing hearts and minds about like what it actually means to be working for your self-interest and for the interests of all, all communities. And so there's so many different ways to get involved. I know like Maxine shared um, a lot of different things when yeah. she was speaking. And so um, as we are entering a time of hiatus from the podcast, I would encourage everyone to think about um, all three of our topics from this series, um, whether that be prayer, anti-racism work, or economic justice work, and think about what's a step that you can take in any of those areas, um, just, you know, in anti-racism work. There are multiple points of engagement. Um, there are many ways to pray, as we have learned about. Like, and so there, there's a way for you to do all of that. And so um, we just want to encourage you to be reflecting on that this summer. And uh, we want to thank you for listening in to all of these great conversations. We are going to be taking a break for the summer. So keep following along on social media to see what's going to come next.